Mm-hmm. 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 Okay. Good morning. Oh, come on in. Ba, 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 ba. All right, let's see. Okay, y'all call me good and sweaty. I was able to beat the sun this morning and actually go out and get my run on before I uh, start my life. So, so but now I'm going to do my, my cool down as I talk to y'all. What's wrong? But anyway, nice little breeze out here, so it's going to be all right. Uh, so, a couple of things to talk about uh, this morning. Uh, just a couple of quick topics that ran across the news recently. I'm just giving my spin on it. You can always go and look up the stories yourself. If anything I left out, say, hey, Rico, did you know this part? I'll probably say, well, yeah, or I'll probably say no. Uh, first, before I get started, welcome to my my page, my YouTube channel. Thank you so much for just checking it out and hearing what I have to say, because, you know, they're all opinions, and uh, that's what we do. That's what I do. I share opinions. I've been doing this since I was, I think, early high school, years ago, in the 80s. Blew up when I went to college, and it's uh, continued to blow up when I left college. So, on meaning, more people heard, and more people reacted, that kind of stuff. You know, I'm not in a, I didn't never make it to a syndicated column or anything in a newspaper. But I always wrote my own stuff and put it out myself, which is cool. So, <sighs> this morning I'm gonna remind you, hey, what's the Good morning, Quentin? What's up? Uh. If you haven't already, if you haven't heard, I always have my little short story. And I'm going to quit calling it my little short story. It's, it's really actually pretty damn cool. Short story that I wrote called The Greatest Pain I Ever Felt. It's a 40-page, like a 40-pager, page PDF, formatted little piece I wrote. And it kind of detailed the first time I, well, when I actually found out about my biological dad by accident at age 22. Uh, but I didn't meet him in person until age 39, but from 22 to 39, there's a story in there. And I'd like to share it with you because at age 39, December 25th, 2008, 4.30 p.m., I went to his porch, knocked on his door, rang his doorbell, rather. He came to the door, said, what's up? He asked me, how'd you find me? And I told him, hey, Google Maps, MapQuest. And he said to me on that day, I have to give you an A for effort because I've worked aggressively over the years to prevent you from ever finding me. So if you want to read that story, see what is out, you know, check out the ups and downs, the twists and turns, the emotional roller coaster. It's only $10, dollar sign, Rico the Opinionist. You can hit it through the PayPal as well, Cash App. And if you decide to hit it, hit the Cash App, um, please send an email address so I can email that PDF to you. I want you to, and then after you've read it, Hit me with some feedback because you'll have my email address. I'd like to know what you think. All right, cool. I appreciate you in advance for checking out my little short story. Uh, and it's uh, it's just it actually came a chapter from an actual book um, I wrote years ago, and I'll get that published maybe by the end of this year, early spring or something like that. Cause I'm still working on it and picking which chapters I want to actually release to y'all, but it's a bunch of childhood stuff, which actually is pretty cool, and then uh, after that, I may do a book of opinions or something like that, Just I just like writing my thoughts down, but anyway, um, I want to throw a shout out to what I call people who are also putting out thoughts, or uh, thought provokers, uh, who are on YouTube and everywhere, mainly on YouTube. And uh, first, I want to start out to me, yours truly, Rico the Opinionist, O-P-I-N-I-O-N-I-S-T. I want to, uh, me, then next person, 
these next few men who are thought provokers on YouTube as it relates to getting information out to men. Damn, that wind is coming right now. Uh, I want to start out with, of course, the reigning king of YouTube, I guess, as it relates to the manosphere and all that. His name is Kevin Samuels. Much needed information for black men to eat on. And the next brother, who's killing them right now, Kwame Brown. And then you get into the, you know, the continuous reigning champs. You have our very own grand fam, attorney Dennis Sperling. Shout out to Dennis Sperling. And then you have a brother by the name of Minister Jap. Shout out to Minister Jap. And mind you, guys I'm naming, these are guys who are actually, you know, putting content on YouTube and all over. That's actually moving the thought process of men, of black men across this country. You know, uh, who else can I think of at the moment? Coach Greg Adams, you know, he's not really part of the manosphere, but he gives out good information that, that men of all groups can use. And, of course, Mr. Palmer, you know, F child support. That's He's really getting the brothers educated, getting black men, young black men as well, on the dangers of child support. And he even goes into a little, some, some parts about divorce. Now, Coach Greg Adams is really good about the divorce part. Uh, who else? Uh, and by the way, for Minister Jab, this for the brothers in the, he's for the guys, mainly for the brothers in the hood and the streets, you know, 16, well, 18, up to like 30 years old. That's his crowd, because I'm telling you, because, you know, it is, he is, that he is an acquired taste. Uh, who am I leaving out? Oh, yeah, my scholars, my specific scholars, Dr. Ron Neal. Who talks to black men about their self-worth and their value. I call him the Dr. Amos Wilson of today. Then you have the brother I refer to as uh, the Dr. Jawanza Kunjufu of our time. His name is Dr. T. Hassan Johnson. He's a professor out of California. He talks about the black masculinist. He's trying to get a black male studies thing together. He talks about all the issues dealing with the racism, white supremacy, well, racism and anti-black male misandry on his channel. If you have a son who wants to uh, really learn from a you know, scholar, the scholarly way of how black males are often um, minimized and uh, attacked in this society, and he uses statistical data. Uh, check him out, Dr. T. Hassan Johnson. And you have an author who talks about black, black males and... Uh, his name is Dr. Tommy, Cur Tommy J. Curry. He's wrote a book called Man Not. I think that's right. And you have, of course, this brother comes with, he reminds me of Dr. Naeem Akbar in his presentation. He goes, by, he goes by the Green Gorilla on YouTube. He's also a PhD scholar who speaks to the plight of black men. He, the way he breaks down journal articles and with his, he has a, a level of, of of way he presents, it's like when, when you hear thunder in the brother's voice. <laughs> and uh, and he goes by the, the G with the PhD or uh, the Green Gorilla. And so these are black men. From, uh, they're from all walks of life, but their main goal is to make sure there is an empowerment, there's a progression, there is a respect owed and paid to and the development of black boys and black men. These brothers that I named. So uh, shout out to all of y'all and those who are coming up uh, in this new era of uh, when black men speak. I appreciate you. visit. anybody that left out, I'll try to remember you for the next time. Uh, let's see, uh, who is that, anybody else before I move on to my topics? Uh, let's see, blah, 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 got him, got him. I think that's pretty much everybody I can mention or name right now. But anyway, and all these guys can be there on YouTube, on Facebook, on Instagram, some on Twitter. So all those names I mentioned, look at all their social media uh, platforms. But YouTube is where they really do their thing, all right? So if you have some black sons or you know other black men, other black male scholars, send them to these brothers and have that conversation because black men need to unite because this country, as they said, is there no country for black men? Well, 
anyway, let's get to it. I have I've only I only have two topics this morning, y'all. And uh, the one is the Haiti and the Cuba crises that's going on, and the second one is about our our favorite track star, our homegirl, uh, the Shakari Richardson. So let me get to. Uh, uh, I'll start with Shikari. I don't know if you've been reading the news. You know, she's been uh, offered a an endorsement deal. I don't know what, if she's taking it or not. An endorsement deal to, I guess, endorse vapes. You know, by this cannabis com- company. And uh, you can look it up and you maybe have more information on it than I do. And I don't know if she's taking it or not, but I don't know. Do y'all think that's a good look? She was offered $250,000. And see, that's what takes me back into our conversation about how we value money over values. And I also know that here, value, having these values don't get the bills paid. But then I always ask, well, how did our people get over? How did our people make it when they had integrity and standards and values before now? You understand? So there's a definite conflict there, but also I believe there's a actual... Um, purposeful removal of standards and values and morals you know and then also let's talk about her image I guess since she got in trouble with it already you know hell let's go ahead and go with it people say go on get that money girl I guess so hell I, I can't say either way you know because we get into athletics we get into music we get into movies you know to make money however when are we ever going to be concerned about images and how they impact our young people. And, and then let me, go, let me make sure I cover everything. You know, for years they made weed illegal. And so many black men have been just chunked by the boat truckloads into prison over some loot. And they say, uh, uh, and they say, oh, punk ass weed charges, as the brothers would say back in the day. And so now that they're making it legal, the white men are making the bulk and the lion's share of the money. So, I don't know, there's something between her and her advisor and her own conscience if she, if she decides to do that, if she hasn't already. I don't know. It's just, but you know, let's go back. There's some people, let's say, um, let's say a tennis player, uh, John McEnroe. He used to clown and cuss the refs all the time. And to the point that they made it, Almost like fodder, fun. And he got on, got to be on TV shows, acting out his his uh, on court on court his on court tennis court antics and rage. So I don't know. It's, <clears throat> when they do it, it's beneficial. When we do it, it's like, hey, what's going on with that? So y'all know how that goes, right? And so uh, I don't know. Sakari, do you? But um. With all of these images and stuff, you know, there's a con- there are consequences. And I guess they say they're smoking it already. Maybe she'll get in on the vape company and start making some of those millions of dollars that everybody else is making. So, I don't know. I just, I guess, I've always been conscious of image. And, uh, and we're people who can use as many positive images, real images that we can get. So, she a little chick from the hood. Get that money. I guess I don't know. I'm just I just brought it up. Maybe y'all can t- check out the story and then you decide for yourself what you think. Uh, but anyway, see that was a quick story, and I when I when I heard about it, I was like, you know, I try to put some thought into it and go a little deep with it. But really, I guess I, hell I don't know. See, I can't even say I guess or hell I don't know. But uh, good luck with what you're gonna do, little mama. I just hope you getting the help you need for the issues that cause you to purposely throw away this this year's Olympics. Uh, and, uh, you know, be mindful of the image because, you know, a lot of young black girls are watching you. And, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting how we don't take that in consideration when, when we make particular choices publicly. A lot of young people are watching. Anyway, let's get to the Haiti Cuban stuff. And I posed the question, um, which one is more important to black Americans? Let's see what's going on up here. Which one is more important? Um, 
Haiti or Cuba? See, uh, you know, recently Haiti's prime minister, their, their president was murdered, and they come to find out that a couple of American undercover or in, informant cops out of Florida participated in the assassination. And but Haiti's always had issues. Issues after issues, ec economic embargo, economics this, economics, and a damn near guerrilla warfare. But from what I understand, it's a very pretty place. And then there's been people who've been trying to help Haiti, but it's like there's some hate that comes with trying to help Haiti. And, and what is it about Haiti that, that the world doesn't want anybody to help them? Are the French still pissed off because they... They won their independence, then made a poor country, a little island country like Haiti, pay them hundreds of millions of dollars back for beating them? It's just weird. And why aren't black Americans more, more boastful or boisterous, if you will, about what's going on in Haiti? Now, we'll go right across the river to the Dominican Republic. And when all that shit, all that whole thing should be Haiti. But y'all, and we understand that there is a skin tone or a color divide in the Dominican Republic. But black people don't seem to look at the, the actual racism and the colorism that goes on and uh, that goes on in Haiti. We don't seem to understand that. I mean, I'm sorry, in Dominican Republic. We, we seem to... Go down there, and, and by the way, this is no knock against anybody who's traveled to the DR. I've, I have plans to go there one of these days. Uh, however, if we go there, we go there to the DR. Like it's not there isn't a prejudice against darker skinned blacks. Maybe because you mainly go and you travel in the resorts, but in that country, you run across a, D, a, a Dominican Republican person. I'm not a black. I'm Dominican. But we have an actual island full of actual pure black people with their pure African blood. Some of, them, some of the Haitians, I'm sure, are mixed and you know, Caribbean out there. But why don't black Americans have that kind of affinity or excitement when it comes to Haiti? Let's go back to when Wyclef Jean uh, raised a lot more money than Red Cross to actually... <laughs> Help Haiti. Remember that? Uh, that they had, he had that little telethon of that aid. He raised millions of dollars. It was through his Yale Foundation for Haiti. And this country got so jealous and so mad that they false, they accused the man, and let they accused the man of embezzling the damn money. Because they let you know when I saw all of that crap, I said, "Well, what's wrong with him helping Haiti?" Why don't, and a lot of people gave money, I mean millions of dollars that it would have gone, gone strictly directly into the hands of the suffering people of Haiti. Well, what is, I'm just posing questions. So why did they attack Wyclef? Damn near took his career. Damn near put a, a scar on the man's career because he, his Yale Foundation was doing something actually to help Haiti. And then black, Amer black Americans annually fly over Haiti to go across the, across the swimming pool to Dominican Republic. And, and even though we know, we hear about them, how they hate dark skin, how they hate actual, they have a problem with their own. If they're dark skin, they don't want to have no association with being dark skin or being African looking. I said, what's going on there? I'm not saying don't go there and all that because I will have plan, and plan to go there one of these days. A lot of guys say, yeah, I'm going to go DR and get my woman out of there. I'm going to get my woman, but Haiti has Af actual black women there. But we have this thing about as African Americans. We kind of shun the darker we are. And it's all over the world, trust me. White's global, white supremacy is global. Uh, skin tone, or as black women refer to as colorism, is global. And we practice it daily. We do. And it's funny how We'll take the, a mixed Dominican and we will fight people tooth and nail. They black. They black like us. They black. They black even though, even though the Dominican is denying or saying, hell no, I'm not black. But we got actual black people in Haiti. We just, we don't have really that much. We don't have no, no fervor for them, no energy for them. Can we have that conversation? What is it that 
this internal hatred for African look uh, or actual dark skin and we'll take anybody we'll debate I can be in a room with a Creole from South Louisiana that look like Mariah Carey and Beyonce mama and they will argue the blackness of them that recognize my actual blackness <laughs> that's how warped we are oh we're getting a black mermaid <laughs> so see when I see black I actually see what black is I think of African and when them people see black, they say, well, they got some, yeah, they got some black in them. <laughs> no. See, when I see black, I see Don Cheadle. I see me. I see Whoopi Goldberg. When some people see black, they see the Bailey sisters, Chloe and Hallie. <laughs> and, that's, and they don't go no further than that. They see Mariah Carey. <laughs> and it's like that. Y'all say that Willie Lynch letter was a, was a lie and shit. It's a lot of truth in that Willie Lynch letter. But we gonna have to come to it. Yeah, you put a, you put a, a, a kid that looks like me, when he's he's three years old. He may, oh, he's handsome, blah blah blah. We put a baby on there. It's like one of Mariah Carey's kids, the same little boy. He gets all kinds of heart emojis and and boop boop boop, explosing hearts and smiles and you know. So that's why I think how we treat Haiti because dark skin has been so demonized and so. He said, Rico, how you get on the DR? Because I'm coming around to Cuba. I was reading some comments when they were talking about that. And somebody said, you know, uh, I saw an article where about three or four Cubans just sailed over in the raft and got to the shores of Miami and asked them, and asked them, asked them some uh, folks over there, hey, where is South Beach? And they directed them to South Beach. And someone said, now, you know, if those Cubans were somebody else, they would have been turned around and arrested immediately. And then, of course, some Caucasian or some Negro will say, well, why has it got to be about race? Because the world is about race. The world was created based on race. Regardless of what that little ignorant Negro on Fox News said. <laughs> no, America wasn't built on race. I saw that shit. It's, it's embarrassing. Just, some of these dudes are just stupid. They're so busy trying to be conservative, they'll become just condescending d donkeys. Just dumbasses. Um, uh, so, it's like... And it's the truth. You know, and I know Cuba under Fidel has has rescued and, and uh, offered a place of, of uh, you know, place of, uh, I guess, comfort and, and refuge to, you know, labeled black revolutionaries over the years. But we're not going to pretend that... Uh, Cuba doesn't have somewhat of a caste system, just like India and all these other places. Hell, even America. The lighter-skinned Cubans probably do live a little better than the actual African-looking Cubans. And, uh, you know, they'll, they'll let the Gloria Estefans come all over here all day long. The ones that look like that, they like the J-Lo-looking Puerto Ricans. But the ones that come, the actual Puerto Ricans, look like me, you know. <laughs> Uh-uh, they don't have that same experience, just like dark-skinned Americans don't have them either. So why do we think that it's just in America? And so, that, and you say, well, Rico, how is, that, how is that correlated to the politics of Haiti? Well, you know, you, you wonderful historians out there can tell me better that there, um, that there, uh, there's something going on with the land and the island. There must be something under there and, uh, that, that they want in Haiti. Why they always want this island to be so suppressed and oppressed? Why aren't black Americans, you know, concerned about that border, that Caribbean border? They're always worrying about, because the white Democrats tell us and gay Democrats tell black people, we need to be concerned about the southern borders. The borders, they're not like they're, they're keeping those people in cages. But why, why aren't we all, why aren't we ever concerned about the Caribbean borders? They'll let the... Let the white looking or the lighter skinned Cubans you know, come over. Y'all remember Elian Gonzalez? Remember that five year old boy back in the 90s? He sailed over by himself. I think his mother died, died on the way. And they let him over. But had that little boy looked like he could have been my son, they would have sent him back. And people said that then because it's the truth. He got to come over here and his family said, no, we want him back. They came back and got him. <laughs> America thought they was going to use him as their little poster child. We're welcoming to everyone. And they took him. His family came back and took him. I think his father died and his mother and her family came back and got him. So we can try to pretend that skin tone doesn't matter. It matters. 
The skin tone has always been political. Always keep in mind, there's always a war between Europe and Africa. A war over resources. A war over land, resources, economics, politics has always been that way. To the point that they have the, even their own people going against their own people. Come on, somebody. And so I, I, so, and I have nothing against anybody, but I'm not going to not point out the pink elephant in the living room. I'm just not going to not do that. And it can be debated. But why aren't black Americans more concerned about what's going on in Haiti? I've never been there. Uh, a lot of us are like, hell, they ain't going there. They're always fighting in this. Yeah, we feel the same way about African countries. And, and we look like those people. <laughs> but we won't go. We'll go everywhere else. We'll go to Paris. <laughs> we'll go every, We'll go to uh, Germany. We'll go everywhere else, but we will not step foot on Africa. I mean, how many American blacks y'all know over the past 30, 40, 50 years have actually set up a vacation to go to Africa? It's one of those... Uh, <laughs> But when we go to all of the Caribbean islands where, where dropped off Africans are, you know, be it uh, uh, you know, Bahamas, uh, we go to all, we go to, uh, all this, the Latin countries where Africans were dropped off. We're even going over to Brazil, where the largest amount of Africans were. But we will not go to the continent on vacation. It's just a weird thing. And I'm, I'm saying we because we're included. I'm included in the we. And we're going to have to change this thing. <laughs> You know, and uh, we can and we can worry about the politics of what's going on with Mexico and Mexicans. Why can't we worry about the politics of the people that they're actually bearing down on? You know, why why isn't there a convoy, annual trek to Haiti? And and why isn't there a congressional group or something to create a relationship with our people over there? You know, Haitians are our people too. Now, yeah, they they got some bad behaving ones. Just like we have bad behaving Americans, bad behaving Cubans, bad behaving black folks all over, but still. You know, we have to stop listen, looking at our people through the eyes of the white supremacists. We're going to have to stop doing that. Because uh, we can, because the way we're disappearing over here, uh, the way. Kevin, what's up? I'm going to get in in a minute. He said, got that H2O today. I'm going to get in a minute, Kevin, I swear, man. Uh, so, uh, I don't know, I just, that's the thing that was on my mind, because I'm looking at it, and, 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 uh, my, my partner in crime, Mary Max, posed a question, she said, man, so Rico, how come there seem that, seem to be that much conversation or concern about Haiti from black Americans? That's, and I like, it's a good question she posed yesterday, and because then I went even further, it's like, you know, Today, I went any further, even further in my mind. It's like, you know, when have we ever had a serious conversation about Haiti and how it could benefit us? And, you know, we go to other, you know, Caribbean islands, I guess, but we figured that that is, I don't know, for some reason, Haiti is off limits. And I always remember, you know, like Wyclef had millions of dollars he had raised for the Haitian Relief Fund, and they, they demonized him. They say all that stuff raises red flags for me. Damn, you got a black dude. I think he's I think he's from Haiti or somewhere around there. And he tried to help out. And they wouldn't let him. That didn't raise red flags for black Americans. See, now this is where all of these propped up black voices from CNN and all these radio talk show hosts that are black, but all of them are comedians, if y'all notice. This is the stuff that they could be talking about, getting us together. Because we can walk and chew gum at the same time. But it's like, you know, some things, that I guess they're giving a script. Uh, their job is to keep black folks laughing. Y'all know who they all are. All our talk shows on morning radio and on afternoon radio are comedians. We don't have any serious, serious black men and black women talking on radio. Talking to us as a race, as a group in this country. Every time the white on station puts one of us up there, he has to have a joke or a comedian there. Let me give you an example. <clears throat> I sent out a proposal here in, in Dallas, Fort Worth, right, to do a talk show. It's going to be talking, you know, y'all know how I share opinions here? And I went to all around the station. I sent it out, sent a proposal around all the stations in Dallas, Fort Worth. Even did it in Memphis, but I'm here in Dallas, right? <clears throat> and, um... 
I send it to the hip hop station everywhere, you know, and uh, you know to the so-called black stations or black format. And I went to Hot 10, I mean 105.7. That's uh, and K104 here in Dallas. And I learned that the stations are owned by an old Jewish white man. Uh, Hein, whatever his name, Heinemann something. Some little old Jewish guy, I mean older than Colonel Sanders. And so, and I was, I said, wow, okay. And so, I went in and talked to, I, I mean, I went in and talked to the white guy, old white Jewish man, and told him, like, look, how about just about an hour or two, you can put me in this slot, and blah, blah, blah. Just trying to have something to talk to the black community about mental health, talk to the black community about, you know, what's going on with us, no, blah, blah, blah. He said, this honky had the nerve to tell me, well, you know, uh, hey, you know that uh, it, it should be something more like that, you know, like that Steve Harvey show. How about uh, something, uh, you know, some humor there. I said, sir, there's nothing funny about mental illness. <laughs> I'm, I'm telling the actual truth. Uh, and uh, he said, well, uh, I mean, let me turn you on to another guy and see what he says and let me know see what he said which is what his program directors which was a white boy they referred him as white Gary and I talked to him on the phone he said uh, I said yeah I see I said it could be something to come on in the evenings maybe three o'clock four o'clock little show that talks to the community about issues particularly what's going on with us as a people and well, I know I know my spin, but I'm also very cognizant of how radio is done. So it won't be like cursing and all this. It'll be just telling the facts and talking to us, particularly black men. And this over well, here, Nick, you know, he called him White Gary on the DD in the morning show and all that. White Gary and all that kind of shit. And so I talked to him on the phone. He says, well, you know, man, we had a... Uh, we had very. We had a preacher on here. He said he told me that my so my show wouldn't be wouldn't sell or it wouldn't catch on. I said, are you, are you are you serious? He said, well, we had you know Freddie Haynes had a show. Y'all know real popular, you know preacher here, Freddie Haynes. He had a show. Uh, <clears throat> he said, well, you know as big as his congregation, people weren't tuning in. I said, sir, man, dude, I'm not a Negro preacher. What I say will get people to listen what I'm talking about and I said <laughs> I said okay so but you gonna have to preach on and I guess they really being a smart he's about black stuff but y'all know me you can't be a, a preacher and and preach not the Bible and talking about black freedom it, it two don't go together when the Bible is used to oppress black folks and you can talk about all the blackness and Egypt, but if you still talk about that Negro preacher stuff, you're not freeing black folks. What you're doing is getting them comfortable in their oppressive state. Come on, somebody. And yeah, go back. Say that this, your preacher doing that, talking about some, some serious black liberation, what the community around your church would look like your church. Yeah, I said it. So anyway, no slight, no knock against that cat. It just, I just, you know, y'all know I don't give a damn about black, pe black preachers, period. Or preachers, period. So, they, this was like, oh, maybe four or five years ago. And I let it go. I said, damn all that. Thank God the internet's come in. Thank God for Facebook. I can just share my word then. But I know, based on, I said, isn't it interesting that white men can get on a radio show, radio station, conservative talk, those shows last 10 and 15 years, those men become millionaires, speaking the unwanted truth to white people or speaking the truth, sharing their opinions. Uh, a, a white man by the name of Tom Likas was on about 15 years on radio. Man, pissing white women off, telling the truth. And a lot of stuff we are here today, when he says, he, he said stuff like, you know guys, you know, fat women are for poor guys because they can't afford tens. Well, Tom, you're not that handsome. You're not that gorgeous either. You're, you're an ugly man. You no, know, the white wouldn't be mad. And he'll say, that's okay. I have money, power, and fame. See, the <laughs> go on YouTube, Tom Likas. That white man was on the air for about 15 years. I mean, he got to cuss a little bit, got to let him have it. See, what has happened here? Black men are not allowed to be black men unless they're kissing black women's ass. 
and that's why, because you know what's going on now. And then I and I'll be those white men didn't have any co-host. All they had was the producer, and they got to be on to become multimillionaires, telling the truth to the white community. And also, uh, uh, Rush Limbaugh on the air for about twenty years, speaking his conservative views, multimillionaire, but black men. <laughs> Unless they're kissing black women's ass, they can't get on. Unless they're clowns and buffoons, and everything is a goddamn joke, we can't get on the air and speak our pure intelligence. A lot of those men that I named on YouTube, they wouldn't be offered radio gigs. And it's okay, because they're doing really well on YouTube. And the people who want to hear them are hearing them. The black men who, who need to hear them, they're hearing them. And so radio is kind of falling off. I was just letting y'all know my experience of trying to get, I guess, my voice in a bigger, uh, I guess, the traditional format to talk to our people. And they told me no, and which is fine. And I understand, because I hadn't planned on getting on there clowning, but I wasn't going to be on there being so serious all the time. But you first you have to, but they understand. When they meet a real one, they're like, no, 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 nah, we got to stop you at the door, bro. You're going to mess around trying to wake people up. You're going to offend our female base, you know. Uh, let's say uh, Kevin says I was in Haiti for three days and and Republic for five total no, two total different places. I believe it. And so, but anyway, just letting y'all know that there's no interest in educating and informing and empowering black people in this country based on now they have D.A. Hugo on there talking back and forth, but you know. It should be, those brothers I named in the Manosphere, they should be on talk radio all over the country talking to black people, black men. Because that seems to be, when you look at statistics, those are the ones who really need the ear of a lot of these guys. And they don't want that. They want black men to continue to be uninformed and falling for these traps without having a real voice. They want to continue to put LeBron James up as if, it, as if he's some kind of voice for the people. And he's controlled. We just found out who his white zaddy is. Shout out to Kwame Brown and Self Talk and all those folks who are exposing these these white handlers of these so-called uh, black <laughs> black figures that we that children and black folks have been worshiping. I, I've always said, even before all this other stuff, if white people love them, I'm su I'm suspect of them. Do y'all understand what I said? The one thing about it, white people have two things. They love you or they respect you. They don't do both. If they love you, that means you're a, you're a clown and you, you, you make them feel comfortable and easy. But if you like a Malcolm X, they say, well, I may don't like the motherfucker, but I got to respect him. And so I'd rather have your respect than you liking me. Because if you liking me all over and grinning and shit all day long, that means I'm doing some kind of slapstick shit that's not helping me or our, or our people. Or then you have those blacks. I just think the brother's funny. I just laugh it off. So that's the way you cope with the truth. You try to make it into a punchline, you sorry, lazy coward, instead of facing it for what it is. That's how a lot of us do, especially the uppity blacks. But anyway, those are my thoughts. I think we should pay more, a little more attention to Haiti. And also, when Dominican Republic is talking to us, we need to listen to them and stop looking at their beige, their beige and light skin. And uh, and 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 make some better decisions because we know as it relates to the border, if you're light enough, you can come across. But if they say if you're black, stay back. Brown, stick around. You know, white is all right. You know that old stuff they say in the 50s and 60s. Hell, it sounds like it's still relevant. Anyway, this your man, Rico, the opinionist. I'm doing my thing. Uh, it's my last trip around. A lot here, and we'll talk in the future. All right, y'all be cool. Thank you. And in closing, if you have not gotten the book, no, fool with me on the book on a short story. It's a short story, 40 pages. And some some people have referred to it as a page turner. Ten dollars cash app, Rico the Opinionist. And if you decide to hit me with the cash app, please send me an email address so I can email the PDF uh, short story to you. It's in PDF form. All right. Be cool. Y'all enjoy the rest of your day. We'll talk again in the future. Peace.